Welcome everyone to episode 9 of Developer Dialogue. I'm Jean, Strategy Wargamer. I'm here with my co-host, Matt, historical, the Historical Gamer, and Eric Tortuga Power. And today we have a special guest on. We have David from Wargame Digital Studios. How are you doing, David? Thank you for coming on. Very happy to be here, guys. Great to have a chat to you. Yeah, it's great to uh, have you on. Uh, we, uh, I was, I, I wanted to get you on, and I know you're in Singapore, and I was like, well, that's gonna, <laughs> gonna figure out the times there, but we were able to do it, so that's really good. Yes, there's nothing like being on the opposite end of the world to uh, sort out your sleeping patterns. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I guess like. I think we could just get right into it. Uh, so one of the things that we always ask um, people that we bring on the show is uh, what inspired you to go into the strategy gaming industry? What was that game or what was that a piece of inspiration that got you going in? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's more a hobby than a career. If you want to make it a career, you're not going to make a lot of money out of it. But uh, I've always been a board gamer from many, many, many years back uh, in my youth. And it was just at the time the computers were coming to the fore, PCs, Apples in particular, and I managed to get tied up with a couple of Australian outfits that were actually designing games for the Strategic Studies Group, um, SSI originally, and a range of other companies. And that's what got me started. But my day job has not been in this. Let's put it that way. My day job's actually in cybersecurity. Oh, wow. But my um, night job is, is doing um, war game design along the way so this is my hobby yeah when you mentioned ssi or ssg i knew you mentioned uh uh, ssi and i I could tell you when i was a a young kid and i was going through um what was it comp usa if people still remember that um i was walking up and down the aisles looking at just the war games and every single one was ssi 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 (laughs) i loved it thank you for for that experience (laughs) Exactly. We all remember SSI the bit. They were around right through the through the eighties and into the start of the nineties. But yeah, tied up with them a little bit and uh did bits and pieces along the way and uh then had a break from it and then got involved with John Tiller. And and that then culminated in a few other things. So from what I understand is uh Wargame uh design studios uh and John Tiller, what's the relationship there? Yeah, it's an it's an interesting one. I started off doing a couple of mods for John's um, games and the beauty of John's games are they're very moddable whether it's art whether it's new um, scenarios or situations and I approached John back in 2010 and said look I've modded a whole new game for you are you interested in publishing it you know it's it's close to done which they did it was a a game called um, Panzer Campaigns Kharkov 43 and that was back in 2010 and I then, he, he reached out to me, he said, look, I know you're working on another game. He said, I'd like you to pick up a new series called Panzer Battles. You know, the existing team haven't got time to do it. If you've got time to, to do that, we'd love you to have a look at it. So I had a look at the first one, and John said to me, he said, well, look, I don't have a lot of time for programming. If there's a chance of you finding some assets, some programmers or whatever, I'll give you a license to the game. And that's what he did. So from that, we built Wargame Design Studios in 2016 on the back of um, some programming assets, some art assets, um, some management assets, which is technically me, project management assets. And we started from there with the Panzer Battle system and started designing some games for that and then picked up John's Civil War Battle system as well because Berto, our programmer, loves the Civil War and insisted we had to pick up that engine as well. So we are an adjunct to John's business. We're standalone. Um, we publish through John. And one of the interesting things is it's sort of gone another step where we're now helping him update all of his existing um, software oh, wow. and bring it up to a 21st century standard. So we've been involved a little less on the programming, but a lot of the art enhancements and that that you see, say, coming through on Panzer campaigns, that's all being done by the Wargame Design Studio. So we're doing a lot of the the behind-the-scenes work just to help to modernize what are 20-year-old games and keep them relevant. So that's another bit of what we're doing at the moment. 
That's awesome. Yeah, I know the, the a bunch of the Civil War games, I don't know if all of them, but a bunch of them were modernized, what, in the last year, year and a half or so? Yeah. So that was you guys? That was us. So the last couple of releases, Shenandoah and Petersburg have been us. Um, we, we've we reprogrammed it, so Birdo's redone the engine behind it and had a lot of features. We've done the same with the Panzer Battle System and all the artwork that you'll see, all the new um, 3D maps and that, that's all coming from my team or our team. Okay. It's not really my team. It's a really a collective of guys that are just working together. Yeah, because I know some of those, some of those battles are, I, I had several years ago, I got the, um, the Peninsula campaign mm-hmm. uh, game and, um, you know, there were, there were always very detailed uh, you could tell labors of love, but certainly the kind of thing that, to your point, 20-year-old games, so they could definitely use a, a bit of a facelift, a little bit of updates, if you will, for working on modern operating systems. So that's when I saw that had started to happen, uh, I was I was pretty excited by that. Yeah, it's, it's something. John's got 100 titles in his catalog now, and you know, it, it actually takes a lot of time to go back and tidy them up. But we, we're getting there. You know, they've just done the early American War series. We've done the uh, Civil War Battle series. Panzer Battles, being a new group, has been, um, you know, modernized right up front. And that was the template that we used to move on to the other games. Uh, the Panzer Campaign Shell that's just been released, That's that was again done by my team. So we've got a couple of teams here working on that series as well. We don't own the programming, but I own all the artwork. So you'll see there's a brand new art engine in there and we've taken the lead on that. So yeah, it's it's trying to give a new lease of life and, and to be honest with you, I think John's getting towards the end of his programming life. I think he's looking for retirement or semi retirement. And our aim is to try and keep keep the series alive because the depth of research that are put into these titles is ridiculous. It it really is very, very good history being done in these particular particular programs. So we're doing our best to keep them alive for as long as we can. It's almost like uh, good old games for uh, for John Tiller. Yes, exactly, exactly. But th- there's a there's a generation of players too that are used to this kind of game as well, and yeah, it just feels familiar to them. So we try and maintain that. Oh yeah, and I, all I meant, I, what I was referring to was GOG dot com. They they sort of got their lease on life by uh, sort of giving facelifts or updating older games for modern operating systems. So it sounds like that's kind of. You know what you guys are doing for for John Tiller stuff. Exactly, it's pretty similar. the The nice thing though is we are fully integrated with John, and you know there there are some teams that work with John still, but we provide a lot of outsourcing for them just to you know get art assets or programming or whatever done for them. So it's a very symbiotic relationship that we've got at the moment. Yeah, and John Tiller's software, the games that they make are, I mean, you guys make are synonymous with historical precision. I mean lots of research. This is what they're known for, what you guys are known for. Um, just taking a step back for those, for people who are listening to the podcast who may not know a lot about this, can you highlight some of the things that they'd expect to find in John Tiller software versus any other war game that they pick up? And probably like that's one of the points, right? Is the historical detail. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really interesting because John started with a very um, standard engine. And the crazy thing is the engine's almost the same across all the series, yet it can do everything from ancients through to you know modern 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 battles. So it's quite flexible the way the, the software is written. And that, that's the attraction. That's why we've got a hundred titles pretty much built on the same engine. And it also means that as we update art assets and other things, it's transferable across to other games. So that that's the first bit that's interesting. The second bit is is you're right, his historicity that's a correct word, but the historical research in it, it, it's getting outrageous. We're almost trying to compete with each other on how accurate we can get it. And we actually posted something up on our blog site the other day about how accurate we try and get the research behind them. But we spend a lot of time getting information. And and one example, you know, we had guys in the Russian archives photographing stuff for us to get us details for... Um, Battle of Moscow stuff that we needed and we had stuff that no one else had here in the West because it was someone going in photographing it for us and sending it through so with that anal about our historical research and it tends to go across the board with the guys who are involved with the um, 
the physical building of these games there is a lot of different sources that we go to to get information a lot that people aren't familiar with so it's a big job we that there's Google Translate is my friend there's an amazing amount of stuff that's now online as well but we've dug up a lot of stuff ourselves we have people that go into to the microfilm at, in at NARA you know the national um, research in, in the US to get a lot of German level stuff so we get stuff from all over the place but yeah his, history is a big focus of John's stuff and how good it is from a historical perspective and then the commonality of how to play them is pretty similar which means that someone that's played one of the games can normally step in and understand uh, a lot of what to do in another game in a different series so that's probably another big emphasis once you have this historical data you now have to put it into a game. So is this where, like, is there already in the engine, the combat, like how you do, I mean, the typical way of dealing with these things at a, like a simple level is like you have soft attack, you have hard attack. How do you guys make sure that once you have the historical units, the battles play out in what you would assume is a realistic way? Do you guys do a lot of testing or how did you build the, or utilize the engine? We do do a lot of testing and, and that is the beauty of this. The engine behind this it's pretty powerful and it's fascinating designing a game because you might have a generic engine you're saying well I want to represent something in the desert can it do that now I want to represent something in the in the frozen waste outside of Moscow can it do that and nine times out of ten it can and John's pretty responsive if we say look if can you tweak this for me so it's going to reflect something else he's pretty responsive for doing that but what we found with the engine when we create stuff and test stuff, the best thing you can do is do the historical background. And I'll give you one example. If supply was low because, and I'm going to use the Battle of Moscow as a great example. The Germans got there, they were exhausted, they were frostbitten, supply wasn't working particularly well, and then the Russians counterattacked. The system will let us set, us, set it up in such a way that all the values will be the same for the German units, whether they're at the beginning of Barbaros or sitting outside of Moscow. But I can set the supply system up in a certain way. I can set the replacement system up in a certain way. I can set up even what we call a frozen penalty to, to penalize the, the Germans because they haven't got their winter equipment with them. So that I can set up all those factors. And the more historical research I find, so the right number of tanks, the right number of horses, the right number of units at the right place, the battles tend to play out pretty historically. And that's what we try and tweak as we test. We look at what's the end result that we're looking for. Now, how do I get the system to do it? And half the time with the parameters that we're given, we can tweak it in such a way that it can do that. And then the second bit is very rarely are battles balanced very rarely does someone turn up with 10 tanks, tanks and someone else turns up with 10 tanks and they get to shoot each other and you can work out who wins. Invariably most battles are unbalanced so how do you make that into an interesting simulation slash game is the other bit of the the magic that, that you come into and part of that is with the victory points, part of that is have you moved far enough along or captured enough ground or killed enough of the enemy to be considered a victory and and that's where the historical side comes into it again because we sit back and say so if the Germans took Moscow is that a victory yes absolutely they never took it if the Russians beat them back this far yes they did but they historically beat them back that far that might be a minor victory but if they beat them back further than that position they did historically that's a major victory so we look at those benchmarks and say what is considered a win and it might not be a very balanced situation it might be the Germans are holding on for, for for dear life in a defensive position they hold on for a bit longer than historical that's a win for example so it's all the balancing of all those factors but you've got to understand the history as you pull it together uh, I guess my question would be um, since you're developing and also going back and updating the titles um, is John more of like a advisor or is he actually developing his uh, separate games or is he in a whole different type of projects currently? He's been in a lot of commercial projects. He actually does a lot of work for the um, US Army Air Force. So the Army, the Air Force and a range of other people. So he's doing quite a bit of commercial work. That's why he's done a lot less on the um, what we call it, the entertainment area, the consumer area. That That's where we've stepped in a little bit to help him out. Um, but that said, he is doing work. He's looking at a range of products 
that would look, work across not just PCs but um, across mobiles and others and we're, we're talking about what we could do there we're looking at programming languages at the moment that would work on Android or iOS or, or other groups to give us an opportunity to do that uh, so that that's something he's playing with at the moment but we're not we're not there yet so let's not get too far ahead of ourselves but it's a discussion we're having about how do we get to a next generation but they're, they're really light games that we're looking at for that side of it not the depth the stuff that we're doing on the PCs but more stuff that you can pick up on your mobile when you're sitting on the bus going home and play a game so we're looking at some of that and see how that translates across as well so he is doing some stuff in the background but not to the depth of what he was previously I noticed that uh, over the last couple of years there, there uh, you go Jean you got some, you got some mobile game in here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a running bit. John asks about, asks about mobile every every interview. Yeah, so. I'm a huge mobile gamer. <laughs> you beat him to the punch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I'm a, I'm a huge mobile gamer, uh, especially now that I um, have a, a little one and he doesn't let me uh, <laughs> really be more than five feet from him. Um, yeah. So I did notice over the last I, I would say five ten years, John has published uh, multiple iPad games. Um, mm -hmm. the question I have, so you, there is still an interest that you guys have for mobile. Um, what would be, uh, and you said there are going to be, uh, much more lighter games. Uh, would they be free to pay, uh, play or you, are you actually, um, uh, gonna do like you did before where, uh, it would be like, uh, I think it was like four ninety nine for a game. Yeah. It, I don't know what the model is being proposed to be at the moment. The, the approach we'd used with mobile games previously was they were an introduction to the bigger games, and the bigger games being the 39.95 on a PC. You know, they were meant to be fairly casual games, and it, it again, this whole business is dependent upon someone being passionate about it and driving it forward. And there was a guy, uh, let's call him Blackie, who drove the mobile side of it, and he was the one who did a lot of the conversion of games. Unfortunately, he's passed away, and hence. The iPad games, the Android games came to a halt. Now John wants to pick that back up. Whether it would be a four ninety nine, whether it be a two ninety nine or a free to play, I'm not certain. But at the moment we are talking about how do we program in multiple languages so that we can do a Mac, do an iOS, do an Android at the same time and then cut and paste what we want to put into each system and mobile would be lighter than what we would say put out on a Mac or a PC but we're looking at what are the right models to do that um, it's not that we've gone too complex but John just thinks that you know there's a whole introductory market there people who don't have an hour to play a turn a day and play one turn someone who's got an hour and wants to finish a game so we want to see what we can do with that and you know, I'm mucking around within that system an invasion of Russia, Barbarossa, that you can play in an hour, where you're moving, you know, just a couple of big army groups around on both sides, you know, as an example. So we're, we're mucking around with that kind of thing to see what would work. We've got an American Civil War one, which is more strategic than what we've brought out before. So it's, again, moving divisions around, not, you know, regiments or whatever, on a bigger map. So... Again, it, it can be more casual. It'll be a, a fuller game probably on the PC, but there'll be enough on an Android device or an iPad or whatever that you can get a good flavor for it. So that it's very early days on that, but we're looking at how we can get stuff that is cross-platform as compared to being locked into, say, PC only. I'm really intrigued to see how that works out because I think, you know, when you... One of the things that I think was always really cool and was really appealing to me about a lot of the, the John Tiller games is the, the campaign side of things where you have very detailed tactical battles, but it's not just a battle by itself, right? You've got linked battles throughout a lot of the, cam you know, the campaign series, right? Yep. Um, but one of the things that I always thought was a little bit um, an area that, that I would like to explore more is there's a lot of branching and a lot of variability within those campaigns but I always wondered, like, if I'm doing the Peninsula campaign, for example, or if I'm doing the Shenandoah campaign, you know, if if I don't want to retreat as McClellan because, you know, maybe I didn't lose or maybe, I, maybe I'm maybe i finding a little bit better, 
you're always kind of in the the historical or a slight variation of the historical battles for the most part at least in my experience in playing these in playing these games and if a, if you had a little bit more strategic control there are options in there but if you had a little bit more strategic control that would be really interesting to see if you could play mm. with those same ultra detailed oobs but mm. in a in a slightly more open strategic manner yeah i i agree look the campaign engine john's got is really you know, it, it's showing its age and it's designed to link battles rather than give you a true strategic series of options. Yes, there's some branching there, and trust me, it's complex to write them because you've got to have, okay, how many branches will I have? I'll have three. So I've got to write, then design three scenarios with three different options. And let's say each of those have three branches. Well, I'm now up to nine scenarios, and, you know, it just it just gets a bit out of control from that point. Yeah. You know, the system actually does work when you want to do some double blind stuff where you've got a battle and one guy picks his series of tactics, another guy picks his series of tactics, and you don't know what's going to happen. That's where the variability works. But you're right, to get a proper strategic, what I call a total war system, you know, where, you know, total war, you can, you know, zoom around on a strategic map and then zoom into the actual tactical battle when you're ready. You know, that's brilliant if you can end up with that. Are we going to be like that with some of this this new series? Probably not down to the zoomed-in battles like total war. But we're moving it up a level where you are... It's a bit like Panzer Campaigns versus Panzer Battles, where you're doing much more of a theatre-wide approach with um, the higher-level stuff that we're looking at right now. And you'll get a level of battle resolution, but not down to, well, I'm going to put my battery on the hill and fire three volleys and look at who they're shooting at and away you go. But it, it's still early days, and, and that's where it's interesting. I, I'm someone that likes a proper strategic overlay, and then you drill into the battles. If you want to drill into the battles, you have the choice to do it at a, at a at tactical level. But it's horses for courses, and we've just got to decide what's the best return on effort. And if we were doing a mobile only, that probably wouldn't work. It, it's too detailed, zooming into you know, lots of little men on a, on a battlefield. It's probably much better doing it at a strategic level. But we're trying some new things let's just put it that way but i equate what you're saying to the total war system and i'd love to have a system like that where you could choose to zoom in and really do it properly at that level yeah i'm just i'm 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 excited to hear that you guys are working on that i'm curious to see what that looks like though just because like i i personally go back and forth on that because i think one of the other aspects of the tiller games that's really appealing is just to your point earlier when you were talking about taking photos of different geographic areas and building that into those maps and you know it, it, the games are known for their detail and their attention to detail as you've already pointed out so you know finding that right balance of you know staying true to to kind of what makes these games you know very unique while also figuring out how to you know uh, try some different things right to to open things up a little bit. It'll be really interesting to see what you guys do with that. It's interesting when you say try some different things because that's exactly the approach. If we say get a new strategic layer that works, then it's easy for me to build in the tactical layer below it. And some of this is for us to see what works and what doesn't work. You know, the, the challenge we've got is we're a niche within a niche. So this is not massive volumes of units going out the door when we release a new title. So we've just got to balance up where we put our investment, where the return's going to be, and what resources do we have today to actually... And coding's probably the biggest issue. You know, having, having code as the drive it is probably the biggest challenge we've got. Uh, but you, you're right, we're, we're starting to test various approaches, and one of these areas that I'd, I'd love to see us do a lot more work on is getting a strategic engine that works properly. And, and it gives us the flexibility. If we want to drill down, we can do it. And if we want to drill up, we can do it. And we're working through that right now. Awesome. So I'm kind of curious. So this is like a, a major undertaking, uh, creating a new engine. Um, do you have any interest in like uh, possibly looking at like Unity engine or Unreal? Um, and if so, uh, how how long do you project uh, creating a brand new engine from scratch will take? Yeah, we, so we, we've actually talked about some of that. And you look at Unity or Unreal if you're going into a 3D environment. And the challenge you've got in the war gaming space is when you go into 3D, the purists sort of look at you like, well, that's not a real war game. You know, if it hasn't got chits and counters and a flat board and whatever, it's, it's not real. So you've got to work out what makes sense. Plus, it's expensive to do that. We've got, you know, we're moving from 
C++ to C hash. That's the best way I can describe it. And when you go to C hash, all of a sudden you get the capability to work cross cross platform. That that that's where it works. We can use much more modern art assets. So, you know, the problem I've got right now with our old code is we can only use say BMPs, for example, for our art assets, which is as old as you know the hills. You're going back to Windows 95, and the problem with that is you can't do shadowing, you can't do um, opacity, you can't do anything. But if you're suddenly using PNG files, for example, we can do so much more with even 2D maps to just make them look so much better than what we've got right now. Um, we can load in a whole map and then use multiple zoom levels instead of having to literally craft every hex and then have multiple zoom levels and other things. So that they're the things we're looking more from new engines to allow us to build better looking games which is important but also saying is a 3D game what we want or is a 2D game what we want and at the moment probably going to Unreal or you know some of the other third party engines doesn't make a lot of sense unless we're going to a proper 3D approach and our niche at the moment that's not really what people look for so we haven't gone down that path. Yeah, if I was going to a squad level, say squad le leader type game, maybe there's a an appropriate place for it. But at this point, we hadn't planned to use a third party engine. It was building it up ourselves and, and seeing how we go from there. Have you guys been involved in any of the the squad leader stuff? So they've got. Um, it's another interesting one. So squad battles is John's as well, and 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 that is squad leader equivalent. It never sold well. It was really interesting. It was positioned as the the next big thing. I honestly, the approach that was used was, I don't know, maybe not the right way. And you know, the graphics are fairly dated in a couple of other things. It's a fantastically detailed game system, but it needs to be, be reworked a bit like we've done with the Civil War series. We need to pick it up and and reprogram it. And we had a discussion around should we do a squad leader like setup where you literally instead of doing uh let's do um you know the spanish civil war or the you know eastern front or whatever should we go to more of a modular system like squad leader where we re we release all the tools the map building tools and whatever but in the first title you get the germans and the russians say early war that's what you get, that's what you buy, you get all the tools, you get some scenario set up, but it's a, it's a game construction set as well. And then in the next release, we'll release the Americans, or the Americans and the British, or the late war Germans or whatever. So you give players the tools, which is what Squad Lead is all about, by the way, where you get the various nationalities, you get all the data, you get all the historical information that we can pull together. We'd release a certain number of scenarios, but we put out all the tools that that player community could build it up. Now that's something I'd love to do, and we've been chatting about it. We ha we aren't quite there yet, but if I was going to do a squad leader like like approach, I'd take the squad battles engine that we've got and completely pull it apart and start it start again, pretty much. But again, we'd probably go for a top down view, not so much 3D, but a top down view, again like squad leader, and and do it in modules. But unlike what we normally do, where we don't release map editors, we'd probably make that as part of the the package to get that community involvement, because we think that's another bit that would make a big difference in that kind of system. Yeah, I mean, I think that was always one of the appealing things with, like, Combat Mission, for example, was that ability for user-generated battles and whatnot. It certainly adds to the, the depth of, of the experience when you can just go out there and you know, get another 50 battles or get another 100 battles added to the game. Exactly, and that's the idea. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm, the squad battles is what uh, kind of drove me. Uh, it was how I discovered John Tiller Games. And, uh, yeah, that that would be really incredible if you guys go down that route. I can imagine so many um, possibilities with that. Like, you guys can focus on, like, uh, battles like Black Hawk Down and such. Um, with that engine, it would be incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things that it was never a big seller and they weren't quite certain why. They thought it was going to be the squad leader you know, equivalent. But I think the approach that was used, it just didn't quite work. And, and I think if we took something out of how squad leaders did work, 
we do a lot better by doing it in this modular approach. And as I said, to me, it's the community involvement that's the big thing here. If we can get the community involved, that's where you get a life to a game. And you know, John's products have always been great for modders, but officially sanctioning, we want you guys to mod the game. We want you to put out your own content. Uh, you know what we'd probably lock is the OB side of it. So we, what we'd do is we'd say, yeah, you're getting all the early war, war Germans. Here's what you're buying. You're getting the 1939 to 1942 Germans. You're getting the 1939 to 1942 Russians, and that's the bit becomes the new modules that you get. And that again, that's how Squad Leader was built up. You'd buy the module for the Brits. You buy the module for the Anzacs. You buy the modules for the Japanese, and we'd then release new terrain types, for example. That they be the models that you'd end up with, but then we'd let the community go crazy with it and let them build their own situations with, with the tools that we're providing them. So we'll see. It's, it's a discussion. It's pretty interesting because uh, I guess your start with John Teller was through community involvement as well. Um, what, what, now that you've made this jump to the other side, what do you see as the difference from when you were a modder to now working officially for the game? Oh, it's a huge difference. You know, you've got a voice for a start. You know, you carry some authority in the mix. Um, you can ask for changes, and it's not like, well, you've got three heads. You know, a lot of the art changes have happened. And look, I'm not an artist, but to you what, I'm self-taught pretty quickly along the way. It, you, you can propose things um, and do prototypes of them, and you get listened to. It gets programmed. So Shelled 44, the latest Panzer campaigns, it's only come out you know, a month or so ago, we include the new high-res engine. And, and the crazy thing was I'd asked for this God, 10 years ago when I was a modder. And no, don't need it. You know, it's too much work, etc. But the crazy thing was it was them being put into all the Napoleonic series that John's got. You know, he was doing it himself. And I said, well, if we're do, doing that this year, putting it into Napoleonics, can we do the same for Panzer campaigns? Oh, yeah, that's easy. And suddenly we've got this new graphics engine, which is... Interestingly, and this happens every time we do a patch or an update, revitalize that whole community. You know, John's got his sale on right now, his winter sale. The sales have been great because people are anticipating this new graphics engine that we, we released with Shelled coming out for the other 23 titles that have been released. So there's, there's method in the madness, but being in the loop and part of the conversation as compared to being a modder where you know, I might even get to John, I can have influence or we can have influence on what gets prioritized, what comes next, uh, what system gets focused on. We can suggest things like what we're talking about with squad leader as a, a potential path forward with squad battles. You know, can we re-engineer it? And that's what makes a difference, being on the inside. As a modder, you, you put stuff up, a very small community sees what you're doing, whereas when you're officially sanctioned by John, you know, we, get, we get much more press and much more visibility. And even you know, gigs like sitting here talking to you guys. So, yeah, it's a yeah. positive. This is pretty much peak of the world, I'm guessing. This is top of top oh, of the industry. Yeah, <laughs> I've arrived, boys. I've arrived. You really made it. <laughs> so just yeah. uh, just in case um, others may not be aware, so as you guys roll out these these updates, as you update update the engine or the graphics for different uh, games, if you're already an owner, then you just get to download it as as you know since you've already purchased it in the past, or do you have to pay for like a for I don't know, like the update. Nope. So this is the beauty of John Tiller's software, and he's probably the only one in the industry. He's still supporting games, and the first Panzer campaigns under his name was released in 1999, and uh, the Smilenx 41. And I was working on this morning the new graphics for that particular game, and that's completely free to anyone who's bought the game in the last 20 years. Wow. So we give them away for free. Um, even John, you know, he moved from HPS, which was his previous distributor, where, you know, they took their cut to self-publishing in 2010, of which my Kharkov 43 was his first game he self-published. We even converted everyone that had bought the HPS titles across to JTS again for free. No more paying it again, even though it's a different company. And those people continue to be upgraded along the way. So it's a pretty nice world that John provides where we look after our customers and that's what's kept the community together that's what what's kept people interested in the work that he's doing you know my big focus has been let's get the stuff into the 21st century um, as much as we can in terms of 
at least the look and feel of the game. And we're slowly with the titles that we're coding, working on the interface and trying to make that a little bit easier as well and standardize that wherever we can as well. So yeah, it's all free, all free, all these upgrades, all these, you know, I'm working on all the Panzer campaigns right now, all 23 titles before Shell. They'll all get this new high res engine and we should have them all out hopefully by February. Everything oh, wow. going well, we'll have the whole 23 ready to go and out to the masses. And we're telling people now, they're all buying discounted product on John Sale in the anticipation of those updates coming through. So, you know, it, it's a good thing. I want to piggyback off something that you said earlier, um, well, your interaction with the community. Um, it was really, that was actually one of the questions that I had, how do you, if you, if you guys do interact with the community, but since you mentioned that you do, uh, I'm kind of curious, um, what changes have you made to the game based upon user feedback? What was like the most uh, requested uh, item to be put in the game? Uh, it's, it's interesting you say that. So we really respond to user feedback. Um, and we listen, and I change my development plans quite regularly because of that. I'll give you one example. We did a massive upgrade of Panzer Campaigns only two years ago. We moved into what we called the Gold Series, which is we essentially relaunched um, the games. The last game had been published in 2012, which was one of my games, Moscow 42. So the series had languished for six years. No one had done anything with it. They were popular, but they were looking really dated. And John had relaunched them and used some graphics I wasn't happy with. And I came back and I said to him, I said, look, we've got to redo these games because they're just not looking great. It's not, not our best look and away we go. So we did the Gold series back in 2018, and that brought in a whole new series of graphics. That was great, but we then announced Shield three months ago and said, we got a new graphics engine, woohoo, look at this, look how great it is. And we actually had kickback from the, from the um, community who said, but you just took us through this great big upgrade two years ago. Can I keep all the gold graphics? Well, we weren't planning to because they're all low resolution. We got this new funky high resolution stuff. And people said, no, we want them. So we've included in the game the multiple series of graphics that were available across you know, the two different series of patches so people can go back and mod their games, put in the old series of graphics as they want it. Because we realize we're not universally right or people get comfortable with the way they use things. We've found the same thing with user interfaces. You know, we changed on Panzerbell, went to a very nice graphical color coordinated user ba uh, uh, UI, you know, uh, lots of extra buttons, lots of shortcuts. A lot of people didn't like it. They want the original user interface they've used for the last 15 years. So you realize very quickly that what you think is cool and funky, you've got to have the ability usually to either ease people into it or have an ability to flick back to what it was before. So we've been trying to add in features that we cover, knowing that we've got a long-term community. Um, we will include as an option for people to reload the old um, um, shortcut buttons and other things if they want to use it, with the aim that we do everything with the new shortcut buttons. And, and we see that's just a transition over time, like anything. But that is the trick. You can't shock the community and change everything completely overnight. You just got to ease them through it, issue new games, and be ready to respond to it. You know, we had comments. Um, we get great feedback. Um, you know, the Panzer Battle series. Someone said mortars don't work. You know, I just don't kill anything. I get all these no effects. It's a waste of time. You put all these mortars in there. They don't work. And we said yes, they do. Went back and looked at the code. And guess what? Community was right. We found there was a problem. Guys had sat down, done the maths, proved to us it was wrong. We pulled the code apart, and now guess what? We found there was actually a really major bug in the artillery engine. That's now being fixed. So we get a lot of feedback. We try and pay attention to it. We don't. We don't have time to play the games. We do a lot of testing. We do a lot of testing against the AI. We do. We have our own play testers. But once a product gets out in the wild. You get feedback from players and you've got to listen to them. So we, we do take it on board and try and work out whether there's an issue or not and, and then get it fixed. But yeah, like artillery in the next series of Panzer Battles um, upgrades will be quite different to, to what it is right now because of the bug that the guys found. It's funny that you talked about the interface. And by the way, that sounds like 
phenomenal customer support. That's uh, really admirable. You guys are supporting things so far in the past and free updates and all this. But it's one of the things that John Teller is also known for. At least they have this reputation for having this archaic user interface or, oh, it's a little bit hard. This is just one of those things that people joke about even. They say, oh, is it a John Tiller interface, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and yet I played Panzer Campaign's Shell 44, um, you know, just basically to prep to see how everything. And I was I was like, this is this isn't cumbersome at all. So is this one of the ones that is, am I just, you know, is this an, an updated GUI or yeah, there's a there's a little bit of update in that. It's not as updated as the Panzer Battles ones. We've had more stuff in there, but we have tidied the GUI up where we can in Panzer campaigns because John's the programmer on that. I can only get so much, so it comes down to me prioritizing what time I can get off John and what's more important. Is it is it more important getting a GUI update or is it more important getting something else done? But yeah, that there, there is we've tidied up the GUI where we can in that. If I, if I had time, we would do what we've done in Panzer Battles, which has got a really nice GUI in it, um, and we continue to refine that and and standardize probably Panzer campaigns and what we've done with Panzer Battles. But again, it's a step at a time. But you're right, it's not that bad. The, the GUIs are quite intuitive once you get a hand, your head around it, and nearly all the games work the same way. So that's the other nice thing is that people... Once they learn the GUI in one game, it's pretty familiar in the next. So that, that, that makes a big difference. But yes, we are tidying them up. I also I think that you kind of mentioned a little bit ago, but I think that's an, a very interesting challenge, the fact that you're supporting games that are 20 years old now, but with that comes challenges that a lot of developers would never have to worry about, and, and that's, to your point, bringing the customers along, right? Because you've got this you know loyal you know, following who've been with, with the series for years and years. And as you, as you try and update the games and as you try and bring them uh, to, to a wider base or, or to a, maybe a newer base, it, it results in, uh, you know, having to worry about making sure that you don't leave behind, you know, your loyal customers. And that, I think that's a challenge a lot of studios probably never have to worry about because they, they drop a game and then, I don't know, two, three years later, and that may be generous, you're on moving on to something completely unrelated and you never touch the other game and, and you just you know, you release a sequel but but you know, you don't have to worry about catering to, to an audience that's that's sort of, you know, been putting the the butter on the table for twenty years. Correct. And that that is a difference. And as I said, you know, John's got close to a hundred games in his catalogue now. So that's not inconsequential. And you know, it normally takes me between eighteen months to three years to get a game out. So you can imagine the rate they were going early on, you know, to to have the number of games that he's now got in his catalog. It's a lot to maintain it, but that community is the key bit, and the loyalty is why we keep everything free. Um, you know, there's been talk about why don't you republish some of these, you know, and and charge for them. We've decided it's not worth it. You know, that we've got enough other topics to do. You know, the number of games that we've got here in Wargame Design Studio that are brand new that we're working on. It's not just these updates. You know, the updates is just the bread and butter day to day work. But, you know, I could say and this will interest people, but you know, we've got five Panzer campaigns underway at the moment. You know, new titles underway and we've got two new Panzer battles that are underway. So trying to keep those going and there's a what we would call the final uh, Civil War battles game because we covered every major engagement in that ba- in that conflict. But there's a Civil War battles game that's well underway as well. So we've got a big pipeline that we're trying to maintain. And this is the bit I love. We ended up... So the guys who did Shelt were modders. Oh, wow. They had modded France 40 and came to us and said, oh, by the way, we've done this work. Would you like to publish it? And we looked and went, this is phenomenal. We included with the with the gold update for France 40 when we did it, and they these guys are then got stuck in and did shelled in 18 months, which is just superb. And their next title is going to blow people away when they see what their next title is. That these guys are working on, but these guys we didn't even know them two years ago, yet they're on to their third game now. So we're building up this little community of people. A lot of them are modders who we say, would you like to come into the fold? become official and that's where we're getting these little virtual teams from around the world that work together and that's the other thing it's all virtual 
we're all over the place um, building some amazing product at the moment. Absolutely amazing product. One thing that I wanted to kind of cover was, um, so you mentioned that uh, HPS, uh, uh, John Tiller created his own uh, store, which I uh, I did notice, I think like a few years back. Um, one question that I do have, and I guess this comes up for me a lot, mainly because I moved a lot in the last 10 years. And I always had like a pile of John Tiller games. I bought the Jewel case once. And um, some of my favorite ones were like Squad Battles. And somewhere between Brooklyn and Virginia, uh, they went missing. Mm -hmm. And I'm having my uh, family like scour all the boxes in there. I'm like, it's in there. You got to find it. Um, which leads me to me uh, asking, um, what are your thoughts about Steam? And would there any possibility be one day carrying over some of those titles to that platform. So let me answer the steam and let me talk about your lost discs as the second part of this question. Okay. Cause we can, we can sort that problem out for you. So the steam stuff, we talked about it about three years ago. I w I was keen on steam. I said, look, we're doing these gold updates to bring the games up to a more modern state. We should look at steam. The issue is we, didn't believe our we, we thought we'd get slammed on Steam to be honest with you. It's still an old interface, still an old GUI, it's still a bit different to what's up on Steam at the moment and we decided at least at that time not to proceed with it. It's also have we got the programming resources to get everything ready for Steam and more importantly have we got the technical support services ready in case we got an influx of new users. There was also a concern about the negativity that might come up there. You tend to see a lot of negative reviews up there. So we just wanted to make certain if we went on to Steam, and we may, and we may pick, you know, maybe even some of these new titles that I'm talking about may go up onto Steam, we want to make certain we have our best foot forward. And one of the reasons we were going back, looking at the whole back catalogue and trying to tie them up and get the interfaces right, but more importantly the graphics right, is to have an opportunity to decide whether we went to a third party like Steam. And, and put them up. But at this point of time, no, we haven't rushed towards that. We've been approached by people like Slytherin, who'd love us to move the catalogue over there. Slytherin sells some of the older John Tiller stuff that was done um, when he was working with a prior company. And and so you know they'd love to have John's stuff, and that's, prob that's probably a better platform for them to go to than on the Steam. But right now, John doesn't really want to pay a distributor X percentage of his, his business. He'd much rather most of it come into him. So it just comes down to how much more audience would it give us? Is it going to be a positive move? And do we feel like the products are at a point that they're ready to do it? We don't feel like that yet. We're still working through the back catalogue, cleaning them up, tying them up. Um, there is stuff I think we can do with every title, you know, even just with this move to the higher resolution graphics, you know, I've learned a truckload of techniques on things I can do better as I go along. Um, so we're not quite there. Would we countenance? Yes. Is it the right engine? Maybe not. Maybe Slytherin's a better approach. We're yet to decide. But it's not, it's not off the table. But it's not imminent either. Now, your discs before we jump off it. If you bought them officially off HPS, Rich Hamilton, who does support, will have a record of it, and we can give you new downloadable versions. So all you need to do is write to Rich at um, support at JTS or John Tiller Software, and he can send you new keys and downloads for your previous discs. You don't need them. He just needs to have a record of you having bought it, and we have all the HPS records, and we have all the records since. We can um, track down your product for you. That's my customer service for today. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a ring. <laughs> Excellent. You do that. I had uh, one, one other question. I know it's kind of pulling us back a little bit, but, you know, obviously there's different, you know, you've, you, there's different, um, like, categories or whatnot, if you will, different product lines of, of the John Tiller game. So I imagine each one is, is somewhat unique, right? Mm -hmm. But... I'm curious how, you know, with such a huge catalog and with with at least some degree of difference between, like, Napoleonics 
and like the Civil War uh, versus like the er- early American War stuff. How different are those games from a system perspective and from like a, a development perspective from each other? Like, are you working on a similar base and it's just changing some variables or how, how complex is that? Cause again, to your point, it's such a huge catalog yeah. and there's so many, you know, different games and battles that you guys are working on. Mm. Like how do you, how do you manage all of that? Uh, you do, you manage it. It's a, it's all a very similar base. So that's the beauty of it. So there's, um, a mapping section, there's a scenario design section, there's a parameter section, there's usually a data section. So once you get your head around doing one, it's not a big jump to move from Napoleonics to American Civil War. Or even, you know, we talked about Panzer Campaigns, which is the Second World War series. The First World War campaigns and the modern campaigns are all the same engine. So, but with tweaks to reflect the differences, but, you know, you'll get helicopters and wire guided missiles, for example, in the modern campaigns, which you obviously won't see in First World War campaign, yet the engine's basically the same. So we do see that there is similarities between the engines, and we look for those common points. That's what's built in. But the bulk of it is looking at where the variability is. That's what we cater for. So what's different in Napoleonic tactics, say, to American Civil War tactics? Now, I'm not a 19th century expert, but the way horse is used, for example, in Napoleonics would be very different to how it's used in um, the Civil War. So there will be some specifics built around that and potentially parameters in there to reflect charges or other things. That's where the tweaking happens, is usually in the parameter data files, and then it can be handled slightly differently in the code. Um, so that's how we get around it. But it's not hard for us to have designers. So you know, one of our designers has just gone from Napoleonics. He's finished off the Napoleonic series and just did the recent um, yeah, invasion of Japan, um, Operation Olympic and Operation Coronet, in the Panzer Campaign series. He made transition easily. Yet how different is you know, fighting Waterloo to landing in Tokyo Bay? Completely different situations, completely different types of units. Yet he could make the transition easily. And that's the beauty of the system. Once you get a handle on the basics of how to pull it together, how the data is stored, and what the tweaks are, um, it makes it a lot easier. The other bit that's really interesting is each of these areas are driven by some pretty rabid individuals who who understand their areas. We we don't necessarily have cross-functional teams when it comes to particularly research or the basic game design. Where the cross-functional teams come into is maybe the art assets or the sound assets or the sort of work I do, the project management, where I, you know, doing a build for a Civil War battle is the same as doing a build for a modern campaigns battle or doing a patching cycle for it is the same. So that's where the commonality is. But yet the engine is one of the reasons John's been able to be so prolific is there's the same basic engine, yet we're able to tweak it enough that you re- you reflect helicopters in modern campaigns and cavalry charges in Napoleonics with the same engine pretty much. And that's the beauty of it. Interesting. Um, one of the uh, questions that I have here is um, what's the most most challenging aspect of developing one of the games that you have, uh, whether it be um, a Civil War One or World War Two? what's the most challenging aspect? It, probably the most challenging is prioritization. It, it's, you know... In my case, it's really sitting back and saying, what resources have we got? What should come first? Uh, One example. All these patches for Panzer campaigns were scheduled for early next year. We've moved it up to now because there's there's a clamor for it, you know, and we know with with the discounted price in sales, in the sale right now, that if we can promise that the patch is going to be out in the next couple of months, it's probably going to help us sell a few more games. And we, we, we're seeing that. And that's meant I push back another title that we're working on maybe a couple of months for release. So it's just a matter of sitting down and saying what's most important. And the other thing is nearly every one of our design teams are privateers. They're not paid by us. They get paid when they finish a game. They even get to select the subject that they do. So we don't sit back and say, hey, we want someone to do Pearl Harbor or we want someone to do you know, Invasion of Malaysia, uh, Malaya or whatever it might be. They come to us with a project and then we say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, let's do that. That should be part of this series. Um, 
And so managing those teams and keeping them enthused is probably the other big challenge because they are these are people in their own time. They don't get paid until the game's released. So, you know, we've had some games, like, you know, these Invasion of Japan games, got started by another individual back in 2008. We published them in 2019. So they languished for nine years before someone else picked it up and finished it off. So sometimes these games will get started and never see see the light of day. You know, I'm sitting here talking about five titles, say Panzer Campaigns and two Panzer Battles. They may never come out, and that's why we don't pre-announce, because having the people to stay focused, like the average Panzer Battles game takes me two years to do, and you know it's my series, and if I get stuck like I have of late, you know, doing patches for other games, it just that becomes additive onto onto um, the time it takes me to release one of these games. So a lot of it comes down to just managing the guys, keeping them busy giving them the positive reinforcement, um, ensuring that we get them the assets when they need it. So if they say, look, I need someone to do artwork, I need someone to do the 3D mapping for me right now, or has someone got some extra um, research material on this particular subject, can you help us find it? Um, That's all part of the the management of it. But all these guys are privateers, and you know, they're experts in their own right, but keeping them motivated in a game design side, that takes someone more than just someone being a historical expert. It, it means they've got to understand the process of managing a project and what components they've got to do themselves. And not everyone's up to it. So that's probably the most difficult aspect of it and just managing expectations, both the community and what we've got to do internally as well. Now, your answer here really piqued my interest. This is, this is really fascinating, what you just mentioned about project management and all that. Um, First of all, what what side of things do you usually find is the biggest roadblock? Is it your coding, your art assets? I mean, is there one in particular, or is it just a different things at different times? Oh, it's different things at different times. Um, it it's it's literally time. So, coding, I would have said we we started War Game Design Studio or WDS. Let's call it that. That's simpler. WDS back in 2016, and that was because we had some coding asset, and and Berto, our coder, worked rock solid for two years to get the engine up to a certain stage and that was re-engineering John's work we added a lot of stuff to the engine and coding was absolutely critical in those those two years to give us the base of code that we've got for the Civil War battles and for Panzer battles but coding's become a lot less necessary it's all around the edges oh can I have weather that goes every hour changes every hour not once a day type thing you know that kind of request which is superficial like it, it's great, it means I can do something in a scenario, but it's not critical to the engine. Now it's really just scheduling everything. Have we got the art assets that the guys need? Um, do we have maps ready? You know, one of the games you know the guys are moving on to after Shell to have just released has got probably the biggest map we've ever done. And getting a map done is a massive exercise it is a really big map that we're doing right now in in the order of nearly two million hexes to give you an idea and and to do a map of that size is a big deal and and so just getting that done we had the same thing in north africa you know north africa we did massive map at a 250 meter scale that went from you know alexandria you know to almost benghazi it, trust me that's a long way but the nice thing in the desert is it's desert. <laughs> There's not a lot to map, but when you when you're doing a major European country um, and you're mapping it out at a kilometre scale, there's a lot of work there, and it, it's multiple countries in this particular map that we're doing at the moment. So that was an asset that held up everything else. So the guys were doing their research. So my trick is, guys, go off and do your order of battle research. Think about the scenarios that you want to do. We'll fo- we'll do we'll map out a whole map but we may only fill in the bits you need initially and then we'll fill out the rest as we go along so just getting all the right people in the right place at the right time to keep everyone busy that's probably the hardest bit with the project management the other thing is we look for assets we can use again so this big map we're doing right now will work for multiple games we can see a catalogue of five games that could work off this one map so this is an investment for the future just like Berto's coding back in 2016-2017 was a huge asset for us moving forward so 
that's the other bit of project management saying how do we work smart which of these assets can be reused and how do we drive that forward and, and that's what we try really hard to do and shield was a great example you know that used the map that the guys had updated for france 40 um, they'd added the netherlands to that and shield used that whole new map so they were able to turn around and say i can use the existing map now i just create the order of battle and we got the game out in 18 months so that's the trick and that's what i find a challenge to to manage and make work and uh, that's the perfect segue to my next part of this question which is about you now so you're the project manager what what experience uh, did you bring into this that makes you successful at what you do or or what do you find makes you successful at being a project manager? So the interesting thing, it's, it's a good point. Um, as I said, my, my day job is I'm in cybersecurity and I actually run a team of about 120 people across 15 countries selling some pretty high tech product. And it's all about people. It's not about the product, it's not about the customers, well, it is about the customers, but it's about managing people's expectations and keeping them focused and project managing them to the best outcome. I learned that through my work and the whole trick has been running this global organization. We've got, there's probably about 30 of us scattered around the globe doing different things. It's all about listening to them, looking at what their strengths are, employing them in the right way, um, ensuring they're rewarded whatever that might mean it's not necessarily monetarily but rewarded and then showing them that we can get a product out that's well received which then fires them up to do another product so it's just a matter of managing those assets I'm, I'm fortunate in my career I've had to do this kind of thing for a long time manage a range of assets across you know, multiple geographies and multiple um, different capabilities um, and learning how to do things simply is the other thing. If you can work out and understand the process and keep it as simple as possible, it becomes a lot easier to get things done. So that's probably what I brought to it, is just some capability of understanding how to work with people and looking for a simpler path and a place that makes things reusable so that we don't have to redo work too often. And do you find that you need to have an understanding? I don't know if you're involved on the coding thing, uh, coding side of things at all, but do you, when you interact with different people, uh, do you have to have a sense of like what what will help build a better game in the future? Yes, you you have to have a, a handle on all of it. I'm for I did basic coding at my university degree, and one of my first jobs was there was a level of coding. I think I did a a shop inventory system, you know, where where I learned all of equivalent of using basic, for example. It's like everything. Once you get your head around it. And you understand, okay, if I'm going to ask a programmer to do that, at the end of the day, you know, he's starting from scratch. So you understand it doesn't just magically happen. Um, so I've found that, yeah, if you uh, have a broad enough exposure to the different components of what's involved with the project, it becomes a lot easier. But I found that with my work. You know, I'm I'm someone that, you know, get, get out there on sales calls, go and sit with the support staff, go and stand in the warehouse and see what's involved in loading a truck. Because if you don't understand those bits of a business, so if something breaks down because it can't get delivered from the warehouse, then if you don't have your head around it, you can't fix it. So I'm a big one for getting in and understanding the basics of a business. And it's exactly the same thing with projects like what we're doing at the moment. If the art assets aren't right, it's going to hold everything up. If the research has been done wrongly, we're going to make some wrong assumptions. Um, if the code doesn't do what we expect it to do, or we're not flexible enough to be able to change code, then we've got to understand we're going to compromise in an area. So it's just understanding those trade-offs and how to manage it all is the key bit. Ah, it's really interesting. Thank you. Somewhat staying on the business side of things, I'm just curious, have you, you know, I, I imagine, at least I have this impression that a lot of war game developers, uh, you know, they're highly digital already, so they're not really you know, all sitting in like studios. Cause as you mentioned before, like a lot for a lot of developers, I know it's kind of like a side project, a passion project. They're already using collaboration tools, mm -hmm. but I'm curious if there's been any impact to, to you all, uh, based off of, you know, what, what's been occurring with COVID Has that impacted your teams Has that impacted the way you work. Is it, has that changed anything? Uh, no, it hasn't changed a thing because we were virtual anyway. Um, I always think we could use better teaming tools. You know, we 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 refuse to use email. You know, to Berto's credit, our program when he when he started, he said, "I want a web forum." 
I want a proper web forum where stuff is stored up there where I can see what's going on, where I can see the requests. I don't want to have to look through 5 million emails. We removed email from our loop, so we don't use email pretty much. Nearly everything's done on web forums where we can see it. We haven't got more sophisticated than that in terms of project management or whatever, but it's not particularly complex a project management and it sits within a couple of our heads that do the project management overall. But we've found that with COVID, if anything, it's just made it simpler. Everyone's been home working. So knowing everyone's at home not going to the office, it's actually easier to get people and get responses quicker than when people have got real day jobs and they're you know, either flying around the country or you know, at the office at a particular time. We're more certain than not that most people are at home and I can jump on FaceTime or WhatsApp or whatever the, the method is just to track someone down um, and have a chat to them. So if anything, it's helped us. We've got, we've got a captive audience in the team at the moment. Interesting. So it's almost, it's in some ways, it may have made you guys more efficient because everybody's at home and accessible all the time anyway. Um, that, you know, that kind of meshes with what Tortuga was saying uh, in that, uh, you know, he gets a lot of gaming done during the day, I believe you said at one point, Tortuga. Oh, <laughs> it's my employer listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, there's, it's crazy times right now. I mean, uh, my especially with kids you know your whole life switches if you're working from home so i don't know if that's impacted other people maybe it's impacted some of the other people on the uh, wds team but you know if the if this was their nightly hobby or project then hopefully it hasn't been impacted too much yeah yeah it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to i i th i would love to get rid of email by the way just saying like the idea of of doing you know having more collaboration tools in my job that it isn't always dependent on digging through a thousand email you know inbox would be would be sure nice yeah well that's what we've found the, the web forum works brilliantly it's actually the best way we've found to interact and we've got a code section we've got a scenario design section a historical research section a bug section so it's really easy to see what's coming new what's been actioned hand it off to someone to do. We've just found that was the easiest way because, yeah. and again, Bert as a professional coder, he said, look, you've got to do it this way, otherwise it'll kill me. I don't want a million emails and I have time to answer a million emails. I'm not interested in it. So we did it. That's good. It works. Um, one of the um, questions that I have is, so you're going back and you're changing out some of the art assets. Um, when I was playing, I believe I was playing Japan 46, uh, and I might have been mm -hmm. playing uh, one other one. Um, I did notice a few new features in those games, and I should have wrote them down, but it was uh, like probably like one o'clock in the morning. And I did notice a few new features that uh, were implemented compared to the previous games that I've played that were probably a, over a decade old. Um, can you highlight some of the new features that you're adding into these new games? Yeah, well, we add new features every single game. So there's always something new that comes in. So, you know, I was writing up Shelled for this next series of patches. There's a truckload of stuff. We changed amphibious movement, for example. We changed, we added irregular troops. So, you know, so we could get the yeah, the resistance troops in, for example, which you now see in Shelled. Well, the guys are going back to add some of that into some prior titles. So there's always new stuff being added. Um which may which makes it really interesting and, and that's what i mean john's pretty flexible in that respect and so is berto from that perspective you know like in the panzer battle stuff with this very effective all of a sudden artillery has become effective to the point of maybe too effective we're trying to decide what to do with that but one area we're now looking at is well how do we make it more like world war ii artillery we're going to put some spotters in for the you know core level and army level guns because so that you know you just don't have this sort of modern can modern type artillery which is on call, which wasn't the case. So we're always looking at what makes sense for the game system, what will enhance the game system, and also be more historical. But yeah, there was a truckload of stuff that came with Shelled. Um, not a lot of stuff that I can think with some of the upcoming titles, because we've got you know some big refinements we've done in the last couple and a lot of the refinements came from actually the first world war campaign stuff that um that one of the other guys was doing because he was doing yeah 
about as obscure as you get Serbia 1914 where the Russians and the Austrians fought in Serbia which I never even knew about but that's where he brought in all these irregular troops for the Chetniks which was again another interesting obscure group of you know um, fighters in Serbia but was perfect for us doing the free French and Dutch resistance in Scheldt so there's always from different sources that we get these these new um, inclusion like he added mountain troops in that game which I then picked up all those mountain troops to use in Crete in 1941 because the the um, the Gebirgsjägers which are the the German mountain troops actually went through the White Mountains and got round the Allies in that title so we can then use some of that code in a later title as well so that's where we see yeah, again the collaboration across the teams and that's where the project management comes in to understand what's coming and what could we use in other titles and how can we reuse it so that's where we look at our feature requests and try and work out how often can we use them in in multiple games if we can so we're only doing the code once but it's fascinating I love doing this sort of stuff it's great uh, and I guess uh, I just have one last question that should uh, pretty much finish everything that I uh, wrote down here um, I wanted to know what conflicts or battles are you personally most interested in visiting in the future so it's funny if you'd asked me 10 years ago I said oh, I'm an Eastern Front guy that's all I do I met a whole lot of guys in 2013 who go on battlefield tours every two years and I went my first one was in 2013 I went to Kursk which oh. you can't go to now, just when I was releasing Panzer Battles Kursk. And it was fascinating to see what my research had told me and then walking the physical ground. Very different is all I can say. When you get there and what you're trying to simulate, and I actually changed a lot of what I'd done in the game around after walking on the ground. I've subsequently gone and done Market Garden... Anzio, Salerno, Casino. I've gone to Crete and Greece, which was last year, 2019. And I was meant to be going to Normandy this coming year, which, as you can imagine, we've canned it. But we've got Normandy and Sicily coming up. Now, I didn't have a lot of interest in the, um, in the uh, Western Front, but after I did my first trip to Market Garden, we did Panzer Battles Normandy, and I was enthralled in it. So it's interesting when you get that experience and start to look at battles and I didn't have a lot of interest in the desert until I started to design the Panzer Battles North Africa. Fascinating stuff and what I discovered was that war games treated the Italians particularly bad and they weren't as bad as people think. Their leadership was bad but the actual physical troops weren't bad. So I went and visited a couple of titles that I would never have ever looked at normally. But we decided, yeah, let's have a look at it. And once I got into it, it was fascinating. So what I tend to find is when you start to dig into a particular conflict, you will find a game in it, a topic in it, um, an area of interest for people. And as I said, I was in Crete last year. Having done the game on Crete and then traveling to Crete, it was the best primer I've ever had. And it was fascinating. And what I found for that particular one, because I'd learned the lessons from Kursk, what we'd represent in Crete was actually quite close to what was physically on the ground when I got there. So it was fascinating to see that context. So when you ask me titles, look, I'm probably a World War II, possibly modern kind of guy. You won't get me going back further than that for, for me personally. Like the Civil War stuff, that's another team in our group. I, I don't get involved with that other than the project management. But if you ask me about designing topics, um, in the um, Second World War and on, I'm a pig in mud when it comes to that. So that that's where my interest is. But it's just become much broader than what it was. Uh, it was very Eastern Front, and now it's become you know quite eclectic across the group to the point. You know, I'd love us to do a Pacific title next. That'd be fantastic. That that'd be a a nice area to go to next. Yeah, I think you know what you're what you're saying is kind of speaking to me, and I think a lot of probably a lot of Americans as well, in the sense that like. I, I've seen some comments on social media from different folks who aren't terribly interested in the American Civil War, but they don't quite understand the American fascination with the Civil War. Mm. And, and I wonder if part of it isn't just, and this was something that was suggested, 
part of it may just be the fact that the battlefields are so accessible and mm. they're cheap to get to and you can drive to and and several of them are so immaculately preserved um you know i was talking to to uh, someone who works in aerospace in another another country and he was telling me you know he he, he had been to gettysburg and he's just like even for a lot of the really well preserved battlefields in europe there's just there are very few examples where battles or battlefields are so well preserved at least in his point of view so I, I part of me wonders if it's just you read up on these topics you grow up hearing about these conflicts and then the ability to go and visit it it kind of gives it a whole new context you know you you war game these things and then you have the ability to see it you know the first time I went to Gettysburg for me anyway it was it was really special and a big part of that was you know, I have to imagine anyway, was the fact that I had played, you know, numerous games of mm. the battlefield and now it's it's coming to life in the sense that you're you're walking the field and you can kind of put a new context to something you've spent a lot of time doing in the past. Yeah, accessibility is everything. And that's where it gets interesting because when you can get to it and see it, and let's be clear, you know, the war gaming market, the computer war gaming market is a very American centric market in terms of the number of people that buy games and, you know, the vast majority of the community is there. So any topic that has got, you know, US forces or Confederate forces for that matter, but, you know, any form of American involvement will always sell well. Sell well. You know, I think, you know, I look at the three Panzer battle tiles I put out, you know, Kursk, um, Normandy and um, North Africa. Normandy's by far the biggest seller. Now, they're all good sellers, but Normandy by far, because there's Americans involved, sells very well. And the number of requests we get for, can you do bulge or can you do market gut, you know, part of the holy triumvirate, um, can you do, um, you know, those next, because there's, there's an American involvement. Whereas if I said, oh, I'm going to do the invasion of Malaya with the Japanese against the British and the Australians, we get a much smaller audience. And we found that with Panzer Battles North Africa. You know, it it's not... There's no American involvement because we're only going up to 41. Um, the, so you don't necessarily see the same number of people interested in in those topics as a more American-centric um, group. I'll, I'll take Singapore 41. Yeah, I'm certain you would. A lot of people would. A lot of people would. Yeah, it's a little surprising, especially with North Africa, because that's still a pretty popular theater. I mean, for anybody who studies World War II, I think that that's, it has that kind of, I don't know, the Rommel versus Montgomery. I mean, this is <laughs> a pretty, pretty famous matchup. I'm surprised it's less popular. It, it is, but again, as I said, you know, U.S. forces sell. Let's just put it that way. Hmm. I just finished reading uh, Forgotten Forgotten Armies, which is a, a book about the sort of the, I don't know, it's like the Indo-Malayan... Uh, Burmese theater essentially and sort of it's more of a social history and sort of how the the war impacted the uh, the British colonies there and sort of doomed uh, Britain you know post-war but it it is very interesting because it's a campaign you pretty much never hear about in in the United States outside of you know hey Singapore fell and sometimes Merrill's Marauders and that's one of our biggest challenges deciding what to publish and whether it could be commercial like Sheld was actually a real big decision for us to put that title out because we weren't certain how well it would go just because it's a, a forgotten battle but it's it's done well it's done very well so we're, we're happy with how that's gone but you are right there is a series of topics that we love to bring them out because they're obscure but we've also got to make a commercial decision on them as well i have uh, one last question from the community um uh, this is from the other stream. The original Grognard says, uh, is there a timetable for the gold upgrade or new painted map upgrade for Bonaparte's Peninsula campaign? Uh, so what we're doing with the Napoleonic, so all the, that's a good question actually. And, and for explanation to everyone listening, what we've done is with all the American Civil War, we've added these painted 3D maps, which really lifts the presentation. It looks much better because of them. For the Napoleonics, we've done four of the, I think there's 12 games in total. We've done four of them already, and we want to see what the take-up of them was like. And if we were happy with that, we may roll it out further. But there's a cost to this. And as we keep saying, we give these all away for free. It's not cheap for us to go and just you know, provide these new assets. We want to see if there's a pickup in sales and then 
will probably do the other other titles. But all of them, all the ones that don't have it, which are, I think eight titles at the moment, are a consideration. We've just got to sit back and say, is it commercially viable to do? I guess that's all the questions. I think that's all from my end. Of it. Yeah, I think that covers everything. Um, is there anything that we did not cover um, that you want to maybe add? Oh, just from me, you know, it it's great to firstly get on this podcast because I love interacting with the community and, and trying to share a little bit. Uh, I'm certain I will have created a few rumors out of uh, some of the commentary that I've made already. So that That's interesting. But, you know, it, it's all about managing time. It's a complex exercise. Um, we do try and take the community feedback in, into account, as we said. You know, that's really important to us. The moment you stop listening to your community, guess what happens? You, you don't sell as many games. You don't, don't, don't get the response that you expect. Um, but we'll, we'll just keep pushing on. But, you know, it's great to talk to you guys. Um, it's just nice to get some time and you know, share a little bit of what we do. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. We certainly appreciate having you on. Yeah, definitely appreciate you coming on and giving us some, some time. And I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thank you, gentlemen.